Hey everyone, you're listening to Little Bit of Life Podcast with Little. This podcast is dedicated to having the real, raw, and the occasional ridiculous chats about everything that we seem to think but don't say. Very little is off limits. Sit back, enjoy, and let's get started. Today's episode is sponsored by RarePuppy.com, custom hand-designed pet portraits just for your special pet. 100% risk-free, unlimited edits, and real art by real artists. Make sure you check them out at RarePuppy.com and also use the code LOVELIFE for an additional 15% off. and welcome into another amazing episode of Little Bit of Life podcast with Little. I have all the way from Norway. Yes, we have reached all the way across the world. How crazy is this? I have an amazing guest with me today. You might have seen him on TikTok with his dog, Amazing Diesel and Gunner. We are here to interview him, get some of the uh, backstory, and then go into training dogs, what life is like in Norway and everything in between. So welcome on. How is it going? Hi, thank you so much. It's going very well over here. How is your amazing weather? I'm looking at the background behind you to just nice little cloudy skies and green. And we have the sun up there. It's uh, almost 11 o'clock at night and the sun is right back there. So it's still daytime here all, all night. That is amazing. So tell the listeners, for those who don't know you on TikTok or haven't been live with you, um, what's your backstory? What got you on to TikTok? How long have you lived in Norway? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am uh, born and raised here in Norway. I grew up here in the north, in the Arctic parts of Norway. And uh, I have started, uh, I've always had dogs of uh, one kind or another, always working dogs. Some kind border collies at the farm, uh, malamutes to pull things and carry things, hunting dogs for hunting and so on and so forth. But now I have been a patrol officer like 20 years ago and I had a German Shepherd and I was decoying a lot for the for this kind of dog. Now I had started, uh, I got retired from my job. I was a drug specialist, nurse, and uh, I had to retire because of a PTSD condition that wore me out. So now I had to figure out something else to do. And I started with search and rescue, and therefore Canine Ds came along. And we came on TikTok about a little bit more than a year ago, when uh, the plans were getting ready for her to come. And here we are today. She's about a year old. She's a little bit past a year old now. And we're working every day. So what made you, because I know we, we've kind of talked on the podcast about mental health awareness. I do the same on the TikTok platform. So when you shifted from a position and a career that you had due to PTSD, and then you moved into this, do you still kind of struggle with that? Um, or is it something that, I mean dogs are the most incredible therapy that we could ever possibly have. Do you still kind of struggle with that or has it just kind of assisted in your so-called recovery? Oh, it has helped a lot. It has always, uh, dogs have always been, uh, I mean, I sometimes, I, I used to say that I talk dog rather than I talk human. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely something to that. But uh, the dog has always been a part of my life. I have always been a, a you know, a dog guy. I always had dogs, and um, and uh, she's doing really well. But the thing, to be a man, I'm 40 now, 41, and I don't have anything. I am nothing, sort of. That was a big shift, because this happened overnight. Basically, you you were 
being assessed for everything, and in the end, they kind of concludes that you're not eligible for any sort or foundation of work, as it's called here in Norway. And boom, there, you get a date, and then you are retired, and everything goes silent. And you're just walking around kind of, okay, now what? That was a big uh, a big thing for me. And uh, it is for many other men that I know of. I mean, you get sucked into some kind of vacuum. And to have the dog and the plan with that was uh, crucial for my, for my case. With the going into, did you automatically go into this for search and rescue? Or what drove you kind of to go that direction when you were trying to find what was next for your life? Uh, I I've always uh, kind of had the thing with dogs, and I've had, as I said, I had hunting dogs that they always had a purpose. But to have a, a a sport dog, if I can call it that, like EGP or uh, Belgian Ring or French Ring, and all of these things, it's kind of it's kind of lame in my view. Because no offense to the dog sport people, but it it's basically doesn't it doesn't give anything. It's it's like it's like uh, learning how to ride a tricycle, but what do I actually need for kind of thing? Mm-hmm. So the search and rescue is a very very important part of the Norwegian uh, rescue service here, and it's uh, based on like most other places in the world. It is based on volunteer work, but you are actually preparing yourself and the dog to go out in terrible condition and trying to find people that is lost or are wounded out in the wilderness and as you can see behind me here there's a lot of crap to get lost in here <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of sure. tourists, there's a lot of tourists that come from lower europe and the flat and you know, flat forests and everything, and they get up here and, oh, I want to go up on that mountain, and the fog from the sea comes in, woof, and they're gone. People are, in general, very bad prepared for this kind of environment because it's a very harsh environment, especially in the autumn and also in the summer. You can have, like, uh, 80 degrees in the daytime and it plummets down to 40 over a couple of hours. And you are wearing Crocs on your mountain hike that was supposed to be an hour, and now you're five hours in. So, so we have a role here. We have a system that works well for us. When the police is basically getting the recording or the uh, what's it called the, the 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 report, they hit the big red button, and the entire search and rescue system is engaged really quick. And uh, and we have had so far this year. I think we had four hundred missions or something like that. Four hundred callouts. So uh, so uh, it, it's a uh, it's a quite significant part of the search and rescue system here in Norway. It's called the uh, the Norwegian search and rescue dogs. We are a crucial part of that. So this is basically something that gives me purpose when I can't, you know, have any purpose to work wise. I can still contribute to the community in a very helpful way then. So for those that don't follow you on TikTok, and I'll post all of your stuff because I highly, highly encourage listeners to go check out his videos. Um, I remember on TikTok when you had just come on and you were saying, Hey, I'm getting this dog. Let's do like a poll. Let's, you know, let's name my dog. Where do you start? I mean, for listeners like myself that are like, I have no clue where I'd even start to do this. Where do you start of, okay, I want to do this volunteer opportunity. I want to get a dog. Where did you get diesel from? Like, what's the process to get them? Well, first of all, you need to find a branch of the organization itself. You need to see that there actually is one right where you are, because uh, Norway is. Uh, I mean, we are a we are a tiny small country, but it's very far between everything here. Still, it's a long, thin country, like long, narrow country, but it's very far between everything. I mean, this is like the outpost of Alaska, 
all over the place. This is only outbound, <laughs> except in Oslo and Bergen and Trondheim, the biggest cities. And the rest is like, boom, there's nothing. So first you have to find a branch of the organization. And then you have to come there. You have to study and see what we actually do. And then you have to decide, okay, do I want to do this or not? You can have a dog from before. You get the dog tested. But like for me, I started completely scratch with a new one. So for me, it was to start uh, uh, looking around and see what, what kind of breed fits me as a handler. What, what is my heart breed? Sort of. and for me, it was the Belgian Malinois. Because I decoyed for them before and I liked the, their... They're very athletic, they're very lean, and they're able to work for long, long periods of time without using as much energy as, as for example, a German Shepherd. It's a bigger, heavier dog. They have the same drive. They basically wear out fast because they're heavy. So I wanted a lean dog, and I went for the Belgian Malinois. But you also need to be able to handle and I've been, as I told you before, I've been a patrol officer in a security company with a licensed uh, apprehension dog and protection dog back in the day when it was allowed to do that here in Norway. And uh, so I, 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 I knew what I was getting into when I got this breed. I mean, if you just want a big, snappy dog and you think, oh, let's get a mouth, you're going to get a pretty bad surprise because... These are dogs that really need to be handled, sort of. And uh, when you do that, you get the dog, of course. You need a dog for a canine serve. And then you start, basically, all the way from the bottom to get the dog to basically look at you first. And then you go on and on and on and on and on and on for 12 years. I saw on your newest video um, with you and the dog that you guys are doing training on finding a human hair in seawater. How in the world do you train a dog to do this? Like, humans can't even find humans. Like, how do you even start that process? You don't start with getting the dog to find uh, a few strains of human hair, but you make them find human first. They associate that to find a human with... Christmas Eve. I mean, this is this is this is the shit when they are finding people, and then you stretch this comprehension line in their mind over to certain other things. Like now, the human hair is uh, is also to get the dog to basically search for people who are drowned, also because the thing that is the same smell on a dead person in the water as of a live person swimming in the water, is hair, because it's the same. So that's why we use hair specifically. And before we did this, we had a woman in a wetsuit underneath the harbor, lying there. And then she was used to finding people on top of the water, you know, by the harbor, and then before that in the forest, and before that on the mountain. So she has learned a long way that if I feel the smell of humans, this is good. I need to find that sword. And then it ends up with a few strains in a tent box of uh, seawater. And then it's still the same thing as she started when she was 10 weeks old. Oh, human. That's fun. I need to find the source of this. <laughs> so it, there, it, it started a whole year ago. We've been training basically every day for her to learn. And this is what she will be training for the next 10, 11 years, even more. It is that the one thing she needs to do is to find that human. No matter where we are, if I smell human, I need to go and find it. Because that is what my reward, that is my world, basically, for her. So we are basically brainwashing her to understand that the smell of human, dead or alive, Male, female, kid, up in a tree, underground, in the water, means that something good will come. So that 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 is basically it, it's sort of a brainwash process, really. But this is this is where you start, and then you can end up with her finding a few strains of hair in a box of seawater, placed somewhere on the harbor, or 
in our real life situation, somebody who is who has uh, been um, been been in the sea for a while and is floating under the harbor, then she will mark this, and we can give uh, the families uh, some peace of mind. So this is this is this is basically what we train her for now: is to we hope to save lives, but also sometimes sometimes it's not a happy ending, and we we need to know that this is what we're doing. There is not always happy ending to this too, so that's a very important aspect of this to bring with you starting this. So, with there being kind of that other opposite direction of there, there might not always be that happy ending. How does that affect in what you're doing with the volunteer work with the PTSD and and things that you've dealt with with mental health in the past? Does that affect you, or do you kind of just so called shut it down because it's just part of the job now? It is just part of the job, and I was a nurse before. I've been a paramedic for a little while, and, and you know, I'm 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 used to. Well, it sounds terrible when I say it, but I'm used to that. People. I mean, that people, no big deal. That is not mm-hmm. that is not my issue. But for for many people, it is. I mean, many people they get uh, they get out there and they are approved the dog. So this is also, by the way, why we have changed the entire. Uh, certification process uh, with the beginning of this year because many people before on the old one they did the test they were approved they are sent out on deployment and then first they see that oh crap this 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 wasn't that cool it's cold it's dark I'm alone I'm looking for somebody who is mentally ill okay th- 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 this isn't fun and they pull off after we have spent two three four years on training this uh, handler and its dog. So now we are trained on a very early stage. We are being prepared for what are we actually going to meet out there. We can meet suicidal people. We can meet, you know, whatever. This is something that is implemented in the training and the certification process from a very early stage now. So people are, uh, the average Joe are, much more prepared and kind of uh, told what to expect from this work from a much earlier state than it were before. But for me personally, I mean, this is, yeah, it's just it's, it's part of what I'm doing now. And uh, my PTSD is also, I have it fairly good in, in check, so to speak. That is also something important when we're talking about mental health. You, you you need to be able to to uh, sort of um, uh, how should I say you, you you need to be able to handle like that. So with the canine training, how long or is there like a specific age that they have to so called be trained before they actually go out into the field permanently, or is it just based on each dog, like how quickly they learn? It's much uh, on each dog, and I mean, if you come in here and you have a Let's say you have a speedy German Shepherd that is kind of crazy at home and you want to give it a purpose and you think this is cool. You start with it when it's two years old, no problem. But they have to be at least one year to pass their first test of obedience. And they have to be at least two years to do their final exam. So at a minimum, they are two years old before they are able to be uh, certified and then they have to do a recertification every second year so you always you have to when you when you're certified then you're just in and then you need to keep training to keep this up because if not you will flunk out next time so you always have to keep this uh, training going so many people think that okay you have trained up a search and rescue dog yes so now you just go in deployments and you know that's that's it but it's a lot of training the training just keeps going i mean if your dog reaches the age of uh, 13 years and it's uh, deployable till it's 12 you have 12 years of training ahead of you when you get that eight week old puppy this is a 12 year long run this is also something that many people forget when they're getting oh you know now covid and everything i mean there's a shit ton of Malinois being replaced because they're eating up their owner's house because they didn't think this true. So <laughs> we have a lot of uh, one-year-old 
now coming in that are being uh, rehomed to better conditions. And then some of them are coming into search and rescue. So you currently just have one dog at this time. Is that correct that you're training? Yeah, that is correct. Are there people that are training like multiple dogs at a time, like with different aspects of search and rescue, or is it pretty much just one canine for one handler? One canine for ha- per handler. You you can be certified with, uh, with one dog. You can be certified in three different branches. You have a, a search and rescue, and which means you're looking for live people in forest, land, by sea, urban areas, whatever. Then you have a specific branch for avalanche. And uh, when you're taking one of these two, then you can do a specialty in uh, urban search and rescue, which is catastrophe, earthquake, landslides, all of that kind of thing. So uh, if you're really a really hard worker, you can actually do three different disciplines. But uh, I, I, I'm realistic. I, I won't have time for more than one. Because this this is this is a shit ton of work. Because uh, here we don't have um, we don't have. Um, I talked to somebody in the states. You have uh, HRD, which is a um, human remains detection dog. That is the certification. And then you have a dog that is a trailing dog. They they track people. And then you have a dog that is a uh, air scent dog, and they are only doing air scent. We do everything. We do we do trailing, tracking, air scent. I, will, uh, I mean, we we have all the aspects built into one certification. So it's it's a it's a very wide certification that we have. They have to know a lot of stuff. What has been like the craziest search and rescue that you've been a part of so far, whether it was with Diesel or Pryor or that you've seen or been a part of? Well, I was talking to a guy uh, in the in the same district as I have. Yes, he, uh, he had an avalanche dog. The dog is uh, passed away now, but uh, when he had that dog, he uh, they came up to our area. It was an avalanche, and they, it took a lot of time to get there. But he, he he explained it very nicely in a way. He said that to be able to find he, that one person that now is uh, sitting in France and is alive today, that was for us. Uh, he had, I think, that was his third dog. So he has been doing this for like twenty five years or so. He said all the training for all those twenty five years was worth that one rescue because that is basically what he's training for the entire time and to that that kind of puts it into a certain aspect you know how 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 devoted people are to do this because he has spent a, a quarter of a hundred years in this service and everything boiled down to one moment where he was able to save somebody so, so this is kind of uh, like um, this is this is an idea that I think is very, very intriguing to to listen to these people and to be a part of this machinery, if you want, <laughs> that is uh, that is doing all this training and uh, and um, and working to get uh, all this work done and all the work I'm doing with this dog. I mean, it boils down to maybe one time, time that it will be, you know, just in time. And we'll make the difference between life and death. Because we, we are going out as uh, people's last, last string of hope, basically. So in Diesel's free time, what does what does playtime look like? Because like you said, it's this is a reward and it's something that they go and they hunt for. So what is like the actual downtime in between training look like for you guys? Uh, she has one Kong. A Kong is a, is a, like a rubber, it's a rubber brand of toys. She has one black Kong. The black one is the hardest rubber mix. She has one Max uh, XL sized Kong that she carries around inside the house. Even then, it's all about the toy. Even then, she's like, she's lying with it. She's throwing it in my lap when I watch TV. But she, she's actually quite calm. When she's getting all the all the training, 
done. She, she's, uh, she's quite calm uh, in other perspectives of the life. She's, uh, and she's super obedient. And it's really cool, you know, to come around uh, <laughs> and have a dog that is like a, like a fucking machine when it walks beside you. And it just ding, 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 ding. It does everything. Say, it, it is uh, it, it's really handy. <laughs> I when mean, all the other dogs are crazy and barking and everything, and she's like, "Yeah, I don't care." I mean, you've seen my little, you've seen my little French bulldog on live, so you know, I pretty much have the world's coolest gremlin. So he's, as you say, he's pretty much worthless. He just kind of sits around. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a, it, that's the purpose too. Yeah, he has a purpose. I mean, his newest thing now is to watch TV. He just learned how to watch TV and interact with the TV. Like, it's going to save someone's life. So, you know, I mean, would he save my life? Probably not. Would he search and rescue for me? Probably not. But, you know, he, he serves some form of a purpose. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and that is also something that is, uh, I, I think that is really nice to also point out that uh, uh, it's not only the the working canines that has a purpose, as you say. I mean, the dogs have been our friends for thousands of years, and for some people, just to have that dog as a companion, that is what makes everything worth it. You know, it, it's not that this. Uh, I mean, it's a lot of work with these dogs we have, but that is not the only purpose. I mean, every every dog, for every person who likes to have the dog has its purpose and that 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 that's enough you know it, it's not like like uh, dogs like diesel it's not like they have a higher value to than than uh, other dogs in that manner i think it's important to remember that too that that all dogs they have their purpose and and it's uh, it's eco equally valuable for their owner you know so that's a very important point i think to to point out too yeah, they're definitely amazing companions. It's it's incredible. You can have the worst day possible and they just sense and feel when something with you is off. It's so incredible the bond that they make with you. Yeah. So with Diesel, what's coming what's coming up next? I know you posted that video just recently and you're doing the human hair and the seawater. So what does the rest of the training kind of look like? What's coming up that we can expect? Uh now she is uh doing um She's getting, uh, oh, how do you say that in English? She's building her uh, search condition. I mean, she's building um, stamina in her searches. She's searching for longer areas. She's searching for longer time. She has more area to cover. And people are up in a tree. They're under, under a blanket. They are uh, walking around. There is kids. They are going in pairs. They are walking, you know, crisscross all over the place so the scent is hard for her to find and she has to report on every single case so further up in the autumn we also have darkness search she's supposed to search off a grid in dark and obviously as you can see here that is impossible now but um, in a couple of months we will do that and then we will start on module 3 which is the big main one Then, then she basically has to show that she's growing in her work. She can do. She can. She can search out the flank. She can do a patrol walk. She can do, you know, all different kinds of search. And she will do tracking. She will find objects after people, and she will. Uh, she will alert on objects when she is uh, running free search, or she will do the, do the alert that you saw in this last video where she just lies down and stares at. It. That is an object objects uh, alert so there's there's some you will see just a lot more of what she has been so far in a broader spectrum she will she will get more stamina in how she's working so in norway since you said this is such a crucial aspect for the search and rescue um is it something like the volunteers like you obviously work with law enforcement to find people i mean i'm sure a lot of like missing person reports and stuff come your way so how do you kind of get linked up with these searches for search and rescue? It is always the police that pushes the big red button. They are the one that calls in, calls us in. Uh, a private person cannot call us in for, to look for somebody. They, uh, they, it's always the police that are uh, 
giving us the assignment, basically, always. So that is our link mm-hmm. to the search and rescue system, and it, it's really well organized in that manner. Um, when uh, the police are calling into and they are calling a search, it goes into a main. Uh, wait, I have to try to translate. Uh, main rescue central coordination unit, and when they push the big red button, it goes automatically out to civil services. It goes out to the Red Cross, which is basically the people looking for people and treating people medically, and it goes out to us that are basically able to find the people as fast as possible. So it's a coordinated um, effort that uh, and and uh, oh, I don't know what they are called. This is some kind of civil service units that are basically taking care of all the people that are in the search and rescue units, giving them food, giving them shelter, putting up um, tents up in the wilderness for us to get warm and you know all of that stuff. So it's it's a it's a big operation, but it's basically been a lot of. Uh, if I can call it that, uh, autom- automatization of the whole process. So, uh, for for example, if I, when I am certified and I am traveling from the north to the south, there's an app on my phone that tracks me. So if I get halfway down and somebody gets lost in, let's say, a city called Trondheim, which is in the middle between the north and the south, I will be called in there because the app is tracked. And they know that there is a certified search dog for live find and uh, so on. So, so we have we have done a lot of work on the technology in that manner. So, but it's always the police that pushes the big button that gets us called, uh, that gets us uh, deployed. Well, I really appreciate that you allow us to see the training and you post these videos. Um, I come from a law enforcement family. My grandfather always had, we had a massive shepherd. His name was Levi. So I always send all of your TikToks over to Ohio where they live and say, hey, like, check this out. He's like, oh, there's that dog. So (laughs) so I love that you allow us to see this training and that aspect, because I mean, we see it through documentaries over here in the U.S. and we see it on all kinds of TVs and stuff, but to actually see it in real life, like puts this into perspective of these dogs are like you said in the beginning, they're being rehomed because they have a purpose and they're, they need that constant, you know, that fight and that, that hunt. And so, I mean, even when these new movies came out, everyone saw the Belgian, they're like, Oh, we need to go get this for our family. But it's like, okay, but what are you doing with this dog? Like they're a working dog. Yeah, exactly. You saw when uh, the I think it was the Parabellum John Wick movie come. I mean, six months after that, there was a shit ton of Belgian Malinois getting <laughs> getting shipped around, and it, it, it's I mean, it's uh, it's not funny, but it's uh, interesting to me to see. I mean, how can people be so dumb again? You know, <laughs> this 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 is not this is not an ordinary. This is not a house pet. And uh, people need to realize that. And also the breeders need to be very, very uh, stern on this. And it's, it's bad, uh, if I can call it breedery, if you, if you are not uh, doing this as a concern. Like, like my breeder, for example, I, I went to the southwest to meet them, just to say hi. So I could actually present myself and say and show and maybe look at the family line that my diesel come from that is what made them choose me to be her uh, her owner that it, it took that much and uh, that is good breedery uh, or breeder customs if i can call it that in in my opinion that, that that's what a good breeder should do i mean you should really be careful who you sell these dogs to well, they came out with that new movie. Um, it's called Dog. It came out just in 2022. And same, everyone's like, oh, it has Channing Tatum. And now I want to get this dog because I want to be like this. And and people need to understand, these are, these are animals that are bred a certain way. And these are breeders that, like you said, if you meet somebody and they give no background and they're just like, here, take the dog. Like, you're going to come home with like half of your couch missing and holes in your drywall. I mean, they're, they're not the kind of dog that you just leave to fend for themselves. Oh no, 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 no. 
Uh, my dog is extremely well behaved. He's always caged if I'm or crated if I'm not uh, at home with her. And she's crated in the car. We have a imp. Um, Oh, what is it called? Uh, a crash tested. Uh, here in Norway, we have different rules in the EU. I mean, we get fined if the police catches us and the dog is not crated in the back with a with a crate that is actually bolted into the car. So that that's that, that's the level we are at here. But uh, we are kind of weird in some <laughs> in many ways. So, but uh, but uh, I mean, you get died. I mean, this this is uh, this is. Um, this has really become something here. So I heard you say that they do um, actual training for avalanches. What is your weather like in Norway? Because I, I mean, obviously now it's super late there. It's past 11 o'clock PM and it's still light. So what does, like, I'm sure your weather and like, you know, everything with the environment goes to play with training as well. So uh, here is, uh, well, I am quite far west in the north. So it's, uh, I basically have the Gulf streams uh, flushing around my feet here. So it's quite warm here. It's not that much snow out here. But uh, when it's bad weather, I have the wind here. So when it's getting storm, it is a storm from hell. And the bridges are closed, the boats are stopped going. Some French uh, tourists said, oh, this is so nice. I want to walk up there and boom, they are in a shit ton of trouble. And then we get called out. So I have to go out this weather to search for somebody who didn't take a fucking advice from a local and say, stay in. This is going to be a storm. Oh, I like the storm. Yes, I've seen it on TV. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, then we, and then we get called out for this bullshit. I'm sorry the language, but... <laughs> but uh, it, it's a very harsh environment. I mean, it's steep mountains, especially right here where I live. The mountain is like, I mean, you have to crawl on all four to get to the top, almost. And when it's when it starts to get windy, and then the fog comes in from the sea, it's something we call the sea fog. It's basically getting pushed by the weather systems, and it's all of a sudden it just floods in on low levels. And if you're up in the mountain, you can, you you cannot see anything. So if you're not used to this, or if you're not prepared for this, you can get in quite a big of a mess quite fast. And it's cold, so it can uh, vary from like. 90 degrees in the daytime and then the weather switch just popped on and then you are down to 40 in the same day in a matter of a couple of hours so so and this is what call, catches many people off guard it is the local they, they the locals we are searching for it is people that are getting hurt out there some way or somehow they, they slip and they break their foot or their ankle or something and they can't get back. They usually call in themselves and they are not sure where they are because they are somewhere between the green rock and the big house and the third rock over there. And there's a quite a few rocks here. So, And then we get called in because we can't pinpoint where they are. And I think that's crucial for tourists to know. I mean, it's not just something of, hey, let's check this out to get, I mean, now, especially with social media, it's let's go get this photo opportunity. And then by the time they get up there, they realize, okay, maybe I wasn't as prepared for this as I thought I was. And with you guys going out, it costs money and it's time. And it's something that, you know, if you're like, if you're going to go travel to Norway, I don't think you need to be climbing up mountains to be Tarzan anytime soon. Because if you get stuck, it's going to cost people some money here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thank you so much for coming on today's episode, showing. It was my pleasure everyone what this looks like i will put your tiktok in the bio so people can go kind of follow along with both you and diesel's journey so um can you say something to us in norwegian because i've been on your tiktoks and i always hear you speak this other language so i want some listeners to like hear some form of of norwegian so what can you tell our listeners uh it means uh Get some goddamn clothes on you when you go up in the mountain. Ikke gå i krok eller höja hälla. Ikke gå i krok så höja hälla. Då går det. Then it will be okay. You'll be good. 
Thank you so much for tuning in with me and spending your time hanging out. Hopefully you enjoyed today's podcast and a special thank you to all our sponsors. Make sure to check them out. If you have any tips or topics, feel free to email me at littlebitoflifecast at gmail.com or you can also reach out to me on Instagram at littlecute1az. You never know if your topic will be next. Be sure to join me again for another episode of Little Bit of Life. Until next time, stay positive, stay blessed.